Okay, welcome to the second part of the of lecture six. And I'm going to continue with properties of estimators. And actually, I have already uh, talked about the mathematics of uh, uh, properties of estimators. What do I mean by that? I have talked about, I have uh, given examples that once we suggest an estimator, once we suggest a statistic to be a, to, as a candidate estimator, what we do is we find its expected value of that estimator and we would like to check whether this is equal to theta, the, the, the uh, parameter of interest. Then what we do is in the second step, we find the variance of the same estimator and we would like to see how much the variance of the population is decreased. And we saw that it was decreased by and if theta that were equal to sample mean. That was basically the, the general strategy. And the, still the thing that we have not talked about, how did we start, how did we suggest this statistic, this, statistic, this estimator at the very beginning is still a question mark that I'm going to talk about at the uh, second part of the lecture, a uh, second part of this lecture. Now, now I'm going to uh, talk about that expected value and variance operations, the, the, uh, which is applied on uh, the estimator more form formally. Now, what we, as I said, again, we suggest an estimator and we find its expected value. And if we subtract this value from the parameter of interest, the result is called bias. That's what it says here. Now, this is a definition. This is the bias, actually, of that estimator that we have defined. So what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean is, for instance, when it comes to x bar, we have found that x bar is for any sample size so let me say for any sample size a expected value of x bar is equal to the parameter of interest which is actually equal to mu therefore when it comes to if you would like to use this notation bias of theta hat let me put in parentheses n, which represent the sample size, is going to be equal to mu minus mu, which is going to be equal to zero. For any sample size, bias of a sample mean uh, is going to be equal to zero if we would like to, of course, estimate population mean. So, and these kind of estimators are called unbiased estimators. So again, for a certain specific sample size, if the difference between the expected value of your estimator and if the, uh, the, the parameter of interest, if this is equal to zero difference between them, then the uh, estimator is called an unbiased estimator of, of course, theta, the parameter of interest. For instance, for all distribution, distribution for actual, if you recall, we derived this result without mentioning any distribution of x. x bar is an unbiased estimator of mu. For any population, we can use x bar, the, 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 uh, we can use x bar. Well, of course, there's going to be also the second thing that we are going to talk about, variance. But if you would like to obtain an unbiased estima estimate of uh, mu, we can use x bar. This is the first thing. Now, what about, for instance, median? Now, median is also an unbiased estimator of mu for normal distributed x. What do I mean by that? If the original distribution of x is normal, so it's like that, so I'm, I'm plotting a standardized normal distribution, but it may be around any mean value, it doesn't matter. Note that both mean here and median, and actually mode, they are going to be all at the same location here, since this is symmetric distribution. Therefore, when you take a sample from that population, I again shown in dash lines, if you take a sample of n different values, so x is equal to x1, x2 to xn, when you apply x bar sample mean here, expected value is going to be mean, 
But when you use actually X tilde, which is the sample median, expected value of X tilde is also equal to me. So for a normal distributed sample, uh, using um, sample median also seems to be a very good choice because its expected value is equal to mu. But note that I previously said that when you have a sample, even if you take the first, sam first element of that sample and find the expected value, you also find it to be unbiased. It's going to be equal to population parameter. So being an unbiased estimator is not a sufficient criteria for a good estimator. For a statistic to be a good estimator, being unbiased is actually, especially uh, referring to machine learning nowadays, this is neither necessary nor sufficient condition. Yet classical statistics, I think from the 1920s, usually has uh, dealt with unbiased estimators, so it's, a, it's, it's still a very good property, but it is not at least sufficient. Now, one interesting point, recall that we have defined in the very first chapter sample standard, uh, sample variance as x minus x bar squared all over these values. So deviation from the sample mean value squared I said this is very much like average, but not. What do I mean by that? If this were exactly averaging, then we would have divided by this value from I1 to N, summation of these values by N. But we didn't do it. For some reason, we divided this by N minus one, and we call this sample variance. And that N minus one is actually, and I'm going to prepare a bonus video related to that, although this is one of the, uh, I think, assigned questions, since the derivation is a little bit lengthy, you are not going to be responsible from the derivation. But that's, a, I think, a, a very interesting thing. I mean, one may easily wonder why n minus 1, but not n, right? The reason is actually, I'm going to talk about that in that video. Anyway, when you take the expected value of s square, which is expected value of x square over n minus 1, Interestingly, you find this expected to be value to be equal to the population variance. So if you put here n, note that the expected value, and in this case, we call this estimator this one. From i1 to n, xi minus x bar over n. Expected value of this estimator for population variance is going to give you n minus 1 times n times sigma square. So this is going to be a biased estimator for finite n values. Note that expected value of sigma, uh, this is uh, variance, uh, expected, value, expected value of variance estimate, if we call this estimator variance estimate, is not equal to variance. Therefore, bias of this estimator is going to be equal to n minus 1 over 1 minus 1 sigma square. So therefore, this is going to be equal to 1 over n sigma square. Bias of uh, variance estimator. But if you use standard uh, sample variance estimator, then since you divide by n minus 1, you do not have any bias. Therefore, this is an unbiased estimator of sigma square. So especially in classical uh, statistics, see unbiased estimators as uh, better estimators. But as I said, there's more to do that. So this is definition of estimator. Now, you may ask, what about if, the def if here the uh, non-normal distributions of x? Well, if you have a symmetric distribution, that's nice. Still, sample median is going to be an unbiased estimator. If, on the other hand, if you have a non-symmetric skewed distribution, then a uh, sample uh, median is not going to be any, uh, anymore. The expectation of sample median is not going to be equal to sample mean value. Therefore, it's going to be a biased estimate or estimate of the sample mean value. Of course, you may use sample median to estimate something else, but if you would like to estimate population mean, then this is going to be a biased estimate. 
So now let's continue with the second property of point estimators. It is the variance. And I have, of course, talked about that. And actually, we have found variance of x bar to be equal to sigma square over n. Now, I've got to also get rid of these. Yes. All right, variance of an estimator by definition is expected value of the, uh, the, the in parentheses, the value of that estimator subtracted from its expected value squared expectation. So actually what we just do is we employ the variance operator on that uh, estimated value. So actually what it means is given a sample, a certain estimated value, what is the deviation of that from the expected value of that, uh, 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 of that estimator squared, then take the expected value of the resulting uh, number. So uh, the idea here is this, and I talked about that, we would like this variance as small as it can be. Why? Because we would like our sampling distribution, not that this is sampling distribution variance, as small as it can be, as uh, narrow as it can be, so that whatever the thing that, we, if it's an unbiased estimator of, for instance, for mu, or it may be an unbiased estimator for sigma square, it doesn't matter. So the, 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 the sample value that we obtain here, which is going to be an actual maybe x bar or mu hat value here, or sigma square hat value here, is going to be, is going to surely fall somewhere near the true value. We can guarantee that, at least within some probability. That's what we can do. That's why we would like our variance of the estimator value, is, uh, of the estimator, or variance of the, uh, the, the sampling distribution as small as it can be. Therefore, actually, there is such a very interesting uh, statement. Among all unbiased estimators of data, Note that the typical example is, for instance, if you have a normal distribution, both sample mean and sample median, and even the first sample here, x1, or any sample, and last sample, or the sample in the middle. Well, this is due to ranking, actually, so I shouldn't put maybe a parenthesis, so it's n plus 1 or just n over 2, where this is actually, there should be a kind of rounding here. So any element from the sample that I obtain is expected values equal to mu. So they are all unbiased estimators. But one tend to intuitively would like to use x bar. The reason is because among all unbiased estimators, the one with the smallest variance is called, this is an important term, minimum variance unbiased estimator. Well, it's a long phrase, but actually you can probably I, I get the idea. It means unbiased estimator it is. And among all unbiased estimator, it has the minimum variance. And here is the interesting thing. And this is the first time you probably are uh, going to uh, have seen this, uh, we'll see this concept. The reason why we learn uh, averaging is starting from uh, elementary school is because of that reason. It is. If you have a normal distributed data, x, then sample mean is the minimum variance unbiased estimator of population uh, mean or population location estimator mean. So I repeat again, we have a Gaussian distributed x, and we take a sample of any size from that. And what we would like to do is we would like to estimate population mean. Which one would you use? X bar, X tilde, sample middle, or mode, or the first value of that sample, or n sample value, whatever. Now, although actually all of them are expect the expected value of being equal to mu, the one with the smallest variance is this one. Oops. And if I can show it, yes. This has the smallest variance, and we have found this variance to be equal to sigma square over n. For other ones, actually, for tilde, for actually, we know that for x1, if you take the 
first observation this is going to be sigma square therefore we can very easily see that sigma square over n is going to be smaller equal to sigma square it depends on and if n is larger than one then this is going to be smaller and this is the same case for also median or other estimators so this is the as i said so the the the, the reason why we use sample mean is that much commonly used in real life but for instance, sample median is not that much commonly used is because of that reason. For a normal distributed x, uh, among all unbiased estimators, this is the smallest uh, variance, and that's a great advantage. Well, there is also the concept of standard, uh, if I can put this here, yes, standard error, an estimated standard error. Nothing new under the sun. Standard error of an estimator is simply shown with this. And we have already, for instance, we have shown that variance of x bar is equal to sigma square over n. What we call standard deviation of x bar is actually uh, uh, called standard error of x bar. You can use both of them, but since uh, x bar is a computed quantity unlike x note that x is a measured quantity so we have a standard deviation of x on the other hand x bar is a statistic it's a computed quantity it's a random variable but still a computed quantity from the sample therefore we usually use the term standard error of x bar so standard error of x bar is going to be equal to sigma square over r uh, and, and but is, i'm sorry it's going to be square root because it's standard deviation. Therefore, it's going to be equal to square root of n. And this is basically what it says. Standard error of x bar is going to be uh, standard deviation uh, over square root of n. Now, uh, this may seem a little bit complicated, maybe box inside, another box inside, another box kind of approach. But I have to go one step further because we are going to be using this approach for the rest of the uh, lectures. Well, here is the thing. This standard error of theta hat actually contains sigma, which is another population parameter. So let me remind you where we are. We would like to estimate mu. This is the population. But there is also sigma square here. But let's say that I don't care about sigma square for the timing. I would like to just estimate this value. That's great. You take a sample here. What you do is you employ the expire sample mean operation here or statistic here. And then you obtain an estimated value here. And then you are going to use this estimated value for mu hat. That's great. And what we would like to also find is to have an idea about the standard error. Standard error of x bar is going to be equal to standard deviation of x here, the, this, this random variable, divided by square root of f, which is the sample size, x1 to xn element. You may ask, why do we need this to, to find the standard error? I'll come to that uh, in the next lecture. But the thing is that here in this equation, Although this x is computed here from that sample, when it comes to finding the standard error of x bar, we have a population parameter. So since we do not know, in reality, we would not be also knowing sigma square practically. Therefore, this seems to be unknowable or unknown because we don't know sigma. So here is the thing. If we don't know sigma, which is the case, instead of that, we can estimate the sigma. How? Uh, since also um, uh, a, a sample variance is an unbiased or sample standard deviation is an estimator, it can be used as an estimator for sigma, we are going to use the sigma and come up with the sample standard deviation. And here is the trick. Instead of this quantity, we are going to be using sample standard deviation. Now this is no square root of n, but note that S is going to be is actually an estimate of sigma. Therefore, this is called estimated standard error of x bar. So therefore, the standard here, this also seen here. So 
any estimated standard error value can be found using this idea. Whenever you see a population variance term and you will see the population variance term is standard error, replace it by the sample standard deviation term. However, when you do that, note that since you are estimating the population variance term or population standard deviation term using sample standard deviation, the resulting standard error will be estimated standard error. At this point, why we need uh, to compute this may not be clear, but as I said, from the next chapter on, it's going to be important. All right. Now, the third point is something I have not talked about, but I think you can realize where it, where it, where it leads to. First, we talked about unbiasedness. Unbiased estimator is a good estimator, reliable estimator. Then I talked about variability or variance. The variance with a small, uh, the, the estimator with a small variance is a good estimator. So the best estimator, how can we find it? For instance, can we have an estimator with small bias? Well, there's going to be a bias here, so it's not unbiased estimator, but a very small variance. On the other hand, compare it with an unbiased estimator, but it has small, it has a little bit larger variance. Which one is better? So we need an objective measure, and that objective measure is actually what we call mean squared error. Mean squared error of any estimator is defined by this equation. It is simply equal to, we can uh, use this practical equation here. This is a very short derivation, which you are not uh, responsible. This is bias square and variance of that estimator. So, Let's remember, if the, estimate, the, the estimator has zero bias, then this is going to be equal to zero. For instance, instead of this one, let's again talk about our sample mean. Mean square of sample mean is going to be equal to bias of sample mean square plus variance of sample mean. Bias of sample mean is equal to zero because bias is not that first find the bias, then find the square thing here. But we have already shown the expected value of x bar is equal to mu. Therefore, it has zero bias. Therefore, this is going to be equal to variance of uh, x bar, which is variant population variance divided by n. So mean square error of x bar is equal to this. If you can come up with a statistic smaller than this mean square error, it's going to beat x bar. And really, actually, it is possible uh, in some cases. It will, depending especially on the distribution, it's going to be uh, pretty much possible, which I'm not going to go into, the, uh, into, into detail. But we, for instance, talked about, remember this definition, that, where is that definition? All right, let's get rid of this. Here it said, minimum variance, an unbiased estimator. So among all unbiased estimator, the one with the minimum variance is called MVU estimator. That's great, but there may be biased estimators with even smaller variance. And I repeat this again, I'm not going to go into the detail. There are uh, many estimators, like starting from, it started from 70s, starting from what we call rich regression. Then it has turned into more statistical learning, less so, and then now it's in all machine learning, we have what we call biased estimators. And although they are biased, so their expected value is not, are not equal to the parameter of interest, their variances are smaller, so their uh, mean square errors are actually smaller. So the, uh, the estimator with the minimum mean square error is usually the, what we call the most efficient one. Now, as an example, we can talk about um, uh, two estimators with the distributions that you see on the left-hand side, with the sampling distribution that you see on the left-hand side. So the first uh, estimator of the uh, parameter of interest is theta, and the first estimator that we use is theta 1 hat, and its sampling distribution is this one. Please note that in order to understand uh, this question, Thoroughly, you have to have, uh, you are expected to have understood the sampling distribution concept. 
So this is the sampling distribution. Let's say for this is for sample size, and this is the sampling distribution of theta one, and this is the sampling distribution of theta two. The question is, for this sample size of n, which estimator uh, would you uh, choose to uh, estimate the parameter of interest? This one. Of course, since the exact distributions are not given, we are not going to be able to find the exact results, your exact result here. But let's talk about it at least conceptually. Next, I'm going to solve a, a previous quiz question, which is going to give you some numerical result. Here, the expected value of this first estimator, expected value of this first estimator is, as you can see, since this is very much like Gaussian distribution, at least I try to draw it like that as much as I can, this is going to be equal to the parameter of interest theta. Which means bias of theta one hat is going to be equal to expected value of this one minus this one, which is going to be zero. An unbiased estimator. And this is a good thing. But note that why this is good is because it's going to have zero contribution to mean square error. This part is going to be zero, and we don't want this mean square error to be a high value. Therefore, what we need is to compute this quantity here. We need to find variance of the first estimator. Here, so this is related with the square of this width of the data. So therefore, we can write that mean square error of the first is going to be equal to variance of this estimator. Right, because the bias term is going to be equal to zero, bias square is going to be equal to zero. That's what we are only need to compute. And this is going to be computed from the square of the width of this distribution. Now, when it comes to the second estimator, note that this is also a Gaussian distribution, right? So let's say that sample size is something like greater than 30, therefore, or almost all of the uh, uh, sampling distribution will be close to Gaussian, therefore we can use this logic. Expected value of the second uh, statistics or estimator is, is, is not going to be equal to theta. It's going to be equal to, let's say some data delta value. So it's going to be equal to theta plus delta theta. So therefore, bias of the second estimator is going to be equal to expected value minus the parameter of interest. So therefore, there is going to be a bias. It means that even if you do this measurement, if you do this something an infinite number, I'm going to converge to the true parameter value. And that seems like a disadvantage, but that's not the whole story, actually. What we are really interested in is the mean square error value. Note that the variance of this estimator is variance of the sampling distribution is also a pretty much small compared to this one. Therefore, we also need to find variance of the second estimator, right? Uh, so therefore, this is going to be proportional to the square of the width of this distribution. Therefore, mean square error of the second estimator is going to be equal to this variance of delta two plus delta theta, we may call this, which is the bias, but let's call it just simply bias, bias of the second estimator square. So here the competition is between those two terms. This term, actually this one and this one. Which one is smaller is going to win this race? So therefore, the first estimator, the first estimator has zero bias, but it is a relatively large. Which means that for any sample, you are going, you may be distant from the uh, parameter of interest value. Your your uh, your sample uh, statistic may be distant from the uh, parameter of interest. Well, in the long run, if you take the average of all those, they are going to converge to the parameter of interest but the variance is high. Whereas for the second estimator, whenever you, um, uh, you, uh, you, you, you use the estimator on a sample, you are going to have these 
values here. The point estimates will be around here. Now it's going to be in a, in a seemingly narrower range, but note that there is going to be a bias from the true value. So the competition is, as I said, between those two. So whichever has a smaller mean square error value means that that uh, estimator is more efficient. So what we call a better estimator in statistics is actually a more efficient statistics. And that should wrap everything up. So when we would like to, uh, for instance, uh, we would like to estimate a population parameter, this is again our population, which is always a circle, and any population parameter here, for instance, it's mu. We would like to use the most efficient estimator from a, you on a sample so that we can estimate this mu value. And when it comes to normal distribution, if this population is normal distributed, when, when you take a sample, the most efficient statistic to estimate the population parameter mean is sample mean. Sample median has a lower efficiency and taking a single observation here is a smaller also efficiency. Although they are all unbiased, their variances is going to be, uh, this variance is going to be smaller than this one, smaller than this one. Therefore, mean square error of this estimator is going to be the smallest with the highest efficiency. On the other hand, well, there are cases, for instance, well, I'm sure you have, uh, I'm not sure, but you may have experienced something like this during your experiments. Let's say you repeat your experiment four times, then you, for, for instance, get rid of the highest and the lowest values. For instance, let's say that we have ranked these values like that, from smallest to the largest. Therefore, you do not consider these values and you take the average of those two. Well, this is called trimmed mean or trimmed sample mean. Now, I don't know if you have ever used a method like this, but when you have some, especially seeing the extreme values, you get rid of these, you don't include them in your taking the mean value. So if you have ever done something like that, you are justified in asking me that, well, you said, well, actually I said, sample mean is the most efficient estimator, but here for such a case, we do not take the sample mean directly, but we perform an operation of neglecting some of the uh, sample observations, then we take the mean of the rest of the observations. But first, there is another procedure that we apply. So how can we reconcile this operation, this procedure, with what I've explained about sample mean? Well, actually, I said sample mean is the most efficient statistic if this population is normal. It, especially when you have outliers or where you are likely to have outliers, it means that this x distribution, the original variables distribution, is not going to be normal. But outlier, having outlier, these are there are long tails which refuse to die compared to normal distribution. Well, so actually, this may be something like a normal distribution, right? So this is going to be, as I said, my normal distribution. But this one has heavier tails. And it's going to be something that we are going to see, which is basically called T distribution. So, and in these tails, there may be some outlying values. For these cases, when you are a non-normal distribution with heavier tails, then the efficiency of X bar is, uh, begins to decrease. So for these cases, there may be better statistics, which means there may be more efficient statistics, and trimmed sample mean is one of them. I'm not going to go into those. These are uh, actually called robust statistics, which I have already talked about previously when it comes to sample median and also interquartile range. It's an interesting topic, but it's, not, it's out of the scope of our course. Okay, now I'm going to solve a quiz question, a previous year's quiz question. Let's see. It says we 
have a sample and it consists of three independent observations, X1, X2, and X3 taken from a population mean equal to mi, mu, and sigma square respectively. And the following three estimators are proposed to estimate mu. So this may be any process that you like. For instance, let's say we are producing a chemical, right? And this during this production, there is an a certain chemical substance that we are interested in, the concentration of that we are interested in. And in, in, in our production, that chemical substance has a, a mean value, population mean, mu value, mean value of mu, and variance of sigma square. We randomly sample three of those products. This one, this one, and this one. Let's say, call them X1, X2, and X3. They are independent samples. So they are all independent samples from this taken from this population. So using the X1, X2, and X3, which are the, actually that the amount of or the concentration of that chemical uh, substance in those products, we would like the estimate mu here. So the question asks, which of these estimators is going to be the best estimator? And here, note that best in terms of statistics, is going to mean the most efficient one. Which is the most efficient statistic that you are going to use on this sample to estimate mu? Probably heuristically, since from elementary school we learned uh, sample mean, we would go for this one. It is just sum of the three values and divide by three. But let's also talk about, let's also see whether the other two estimators, how they hold up against sample mean. All right. So to find the most efficient statistic, what we need to find is to find mean square error of mu1, mean square or error of m2, and mean square error of m3, the three uh, estimators or statistic, statistics here. And we would like to see how they are going to be uh, rank ordered. And the smallest one, the smallest means the one with the smallest mean square error value is going to be the most efficient statistic, which is going to be the one that we are going to use to estimate the mu value. So in order to find the mean square error, mean square error is equal to sigma square here plus bias square. We need to find these two quantities. So let's start with bias. So to find bias, it means we have to find the expected value of mu i. So it's going to be, expected value of mu1 is going to be 1 over 3, expected value of x1 plus x2 plus x3. And note that they are independent, and each of them has the expected value of mu. So there are three mu's here. The expected value is equal to mu, which should be, I think, pretty much obvious. Now the second estimator. Let's see whether this one is uh, not uh, compatible or uh, you cannot compete with the mu1 in, ter in terms of bias. It's going to be 1 over 3, expected value of x1 plus expected value of, I'm very sorry, here is going to be. All right, 2 times expected value of x2. Now, this is going to be equal to mu. This is going to be equal to 2 mu. And here is the interesting point. This is also mu. So in terms of bias, both have, have the same performance. And when it comes to the third estimator, it's going to be 1 over 4 expected value of these values. Again, it's 2 times expected value of x2 plus expected value of x3. Therefore, this is going to be again mu, mu, and mu. And we have four of these. Note that all are unbiased estimators of mu. That's great. So what this is going to decide which uh, one is the most efficient uh, estimator is going to depend on the variance values. So what we do is we find the estimator. It's going to be equal to 1 over 9 times. I'm going to do this part a little bit fast because I have already solved this, it's going to be equal to, let's, instead of, let's use this rotation. So it's going to be variance of x divided by 3. Now let's see the second one. The second one is going to be 1 over 9 
variance of x1 plus or times variance of x2. And since these are both sigma square, it's going to be equal to five sigma square over nine. Let me write this uh, as three sigma square over nine so that you can see the relation better. Now, this has a smaller variance compared to this one. So mu1 is more preferable compared to mu2. What about mu3? And note that in mu2, we do not use the third, uh, estimate, third uh, element in the sample. And the disadvantage lies in increasing the variance value. This is going to be equal to 1 over 16. That is going to be sigma square plus or sigma square plus sigma square, which is going to be equal to 6 sigma square over 16. Well, can we make this similar to, well, it's going to be 3 sigma square over 6. I'm sorry, 8. So it's going to be equal to, if you multiply those, if you multiply this term by 9, it's going to be 27 sigma square over 63. And this one is going to be equal to 20, all right, it's clearly 24 sigma square over 63, if I done this correctly. And why if I multiply both sides by eight, yes. If I multiply both sides by nine, yes. Now, and when it comes to this one, if, when I multiply both sides by eight, it's going to be 63 and it's going to be 40 sigma square over 63. Now, these are the variance values. And note that since bias are all equal to zero here, for all these three estimators, the their contribution is going to be zero. So they are going to be basically equal to mean square error of mu1, mean square error of mu2, and mean square error of mu3. And when we order that mean square error of mu1 is going to be smaller than mean square error of mu2, which is going to be smaller than mean square error of mu3, uh, mu2. So this is the result. Therefore, the efficiency of mu1 is greater than efficiency of mu3, which is greater than efficiency of mu2. This is the best estimator. This is the second best estimator. This is the third best estimator. Estimate population mean. All right, now comes the last topic. This is uh, a little bit of an advanced top topic, and it uh, for those who would like to pursue a, a career related with this, these issues, maybe in statistical learning, machine learning, or things like that, maximum likelihood estimators are going to be very important. But for the time being, the only reason why I'm talking about this uh, this this point is to make the the, the issue which is related with how to come up with a, uh, with a statistic that's going to be conveniently used uh, uh, as an estimator at the very beginning. I'm going, I'm going to try to answer this question because up to this point, we have always started with some uh, what we call convenient statistics. We have already assumed that X bar is a convenient statistic. Then we find this expected value on the variance and then we say that okay this seems to be a good estimator for instance in the previous question these estimators are already given to you so compare those the performance of those three all right but how do i come up with an estimator at the very beginning this is the question and this is due to this uh, one way to obtain this this is not the only way to uh, determine a convenient uh, statistics a statistic for an estimator, but this is the most popular method, I may say. Uh, it's called maximum likelihood estimator. So, there is something called likelihood function, and the, this likelihood concept is previously, uh, I have talked about that maybe briefly, maybe I have just uh, uh, mentioned the, the phrase likelihood in Bayesian formulation. Here we are going to be a little bit more diving into this likelihood function. So here is the concept formally. Let's say that these are our parameters, population parameters, theta one, theta two, to tell data, uh, tell, uh, delta p, p of these parameters. These are shown in vector form, that's not important. And then we have a random sample vector. What do I mean by this? 
Now, this is the result of the first observation, this is the result of the second observation, and this is the result of the nth observation. So this is going to be our sample. So nothing uh, different from the, our previous notation, but or previous uh, scenario, I may say, but what is only different here is maybe the notation we show these in vectoral form. So what we call likelihood function is, and this is actually going to show the degree of plausibility of an estimator. This is going to be each of the probability density function values multiplied by each other, and each of these uh, probability density function values are evaluated using x1, x2 to xn, and with the given uh, parameter values. So, I'm not, of course, give an example in a couple of minutes. It's going to be clear, but basically it means you have, let's say, x1 is, all right, we have an observation like that. x is equal to, let's say, 50 and 25, two observations. Then whatever the, the probability density function, you assume that, again, note that we start with assuming a probability density function. We uh, assume the probability density function to be uh, uh, convenient or to be the one which governs the process, we call it f. Instead of the x values, we first put 50. And with the suggested population parameters. And the next uh, probability density function value is going to be with 25. And with, the, again, the same corresponding uh, population parameter values. We are going to multiply those two, and the, the result is going to be our this x vector likelihood function with the population parameter values. Note that this is going to be a different number compared to this for a different number. If we have more of these uh, in your sample, if you are more elements, you are going to be multiplying with all of these, and there is, this result is going to be the likelihood function. So here is the thing, this likelihood function will depend on two things. First of all, x vector, right? All of these, each of these independent observation values, but it's not only, these are all also functions of population parameters. So given a population parameter vector, this is going to be, a, a, this, this whole function give, is going to give you a numerical result. So here is the thing, the values of, Theta, which maximize this function is called maximum likelihood estimator. So basically, what we are going to try to do is since x are going to be given to us, we are just going to place them here in the corresponding probability density functions, and we are going to leave the population parameters as unknowns, and we are going to try to maximize this, this uh, maximum likelihood function by. Uh, changing these theta values. And the theta values which maximize the maximum likelihood function are called maximum likelihood estimators. And these estimators have some very nice properties which I'm not going to go into. But basically, one of the things that we like is as n goes to infinity, maximum likelihood estimators are unbiased. That's a good property. There is another property which, which is related to consistency. It means very practically, as again n goes to zero, maximum likelihood estimators, their variances of maximum likelihood estimators are also going to go to zero. So these are very nice properties. It means when you increase the sample size, you are going to have unbiased estimators and the variance are going to decrease. All right. Now, the best way to explain this is on an example. Uh, let's try to do it. Let's say that, let me start from here. We are given, okay, we are talking about phone calls uh, to uh, uh, an office. The, the distance between the time uh, interval between phone calls. For some reason, we would like to play a game and we would like to find the, the determine the rate of phone calls to an office, and for that, what we do is, once a phone is called, starting from the time here, we measure the time until the next call. Then we measure the time until the next call, we measure the time until the next call, and we do this. All right, 
And let's say we obtain these results. 25 minutes until the next goal, 12 minutes until the next goal, 4, 13, whatever. And we obtain a sample of five observations. The question is, from these five observations, can we estimate, assuming that, first of all, these are independent observations, and assuming that the number of the, 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 the time interval between two successive calls in an office is exponential distributed, the exponential distribution is a single population parameter, lambda, which are the rate of calls. Can we estimate this parameter using these uh, samples? This is the question. So at the very basics, what we want here is an uh, actually a statistic which is going to be used as an estimator for lambda. This is the question. So therefore, we are going to be using maximum likelihood estimator here. How? First of all, I change this probability function into the form that is required by the uh, maximum likelihood function. Note that maximum likelihood function, we show this f as probability density function of x, but not only, but this is also a function of theta, which is actually a function of the only parameter uh, phi here. Therefore, this is going to be, not that the right hand side does not change. And let's generalize this question. Let's say that, well, these are specific values, but for n, a sample of n observations, the, uh, these uh, time intervals are obtained. From this, the question is an estimated value of lambda hat. So what we are going to do is we are going to find the likelihood function. And for this case, it's going to be x tilde. Just a little, let's forget about tilde notation. I don't like this tilde notation actually in vectors. This is going to be the x vector, I may say here. But actually, to show that it's a vector, I need to put it. So I'm sorry. And we have single lambda here. All right. This is going to be equal to f x. All right. f x1 lambda times f x2 lambda f x n lambda. Then, since this function is already given, we can write it uh, lambda times exponential mi uh, to the uh, minus. Uh, lambda times x1, lambda exponential x2, lambda exponential minus lambda x. N. All right, so far so good. So now what we have here is lambda to the power n. We have n of these lambda, and we have exponential minus lambda in summation xi from i1 to n. All right, because when you multiply the exponentials, it's going to be a summation of the exponential of these terms. So it's going to be in common parenthesis, lambda with the corresponding xi values. Now, this is our likelihood function. And at this step, you may think that, okay, we need to find the lambda value which maximizes this likelihood function. So find the, the take the derivative of a likelihood function with respect to lambda, then find it. Actually, we can do that, but the result is going to be, but the procedure is going to be very difficult. Instead of that, we actually apply a trick. What we do is we take the logarithm of both sides. And that may seem intriguing at first sight, but usually we work with logarithm of likelihood functions. When you take the logarithm, this is going to take a very much nicer form. All right, now I'm going to call this capital T. What's the meaning of that Xi actually? If these are the distance between the phone calls, right, or the time interval between phone calls, it means add all of them together and find the resulting sum. This is called, this is T. So therefore I'm going to be writing N ln uh, phi minus phi times T, and this is, the log uh, logarithm of the likelihood function. And here is the logic. Since logarithm is a one-to-one -one function, the maximum of the uh, likelihood function will also be the maximum of the logarithm function. Logarithm of a maximum function, likelihood function. So therefore, I'm going to be taking 
here the partial derivative with respect to theta. So this is going to be ln derivative here. This is going to be equally lambda since I have only lambda here. I can easily write it here. Lambda. All right. So when you take the, the uh, uh, derivative with respect to lambda, this is going to be n over lambda minus t. This is going to be equal to zero to maximize this. Well, actually, I, I neglect the proof related that why this is not the minimum, why this extremum is the maximum, but this is, believe me, it's just the maximum point. So therefore, what we need here is this value here. But note that here we write, let me write this way so that it's going to be easier to understand. This is going to be zero at the estimated value of lambda. If you like, also you can write it as the maximum likelihood estimated value. So we evaluate this derivative at this uh, lambda hat value. So this is going to be equal to n over maximum likelihood is equal to, I'm sorry, t. So therefore, when you put this one here and this one on the other side, maximum likelihood is going to be equal to n over t. It means whatever the sound number of observations here, well, actually, let's make it even nicer. All right, this is n over t. This is equal to 1 over t over n. 1 over, now instead of t, if you like, you can write whatever that t was equal to. It is xi i from 1 to n over n. And note that this is equal to 1 over, if this x, each of them is the, the, the time interval between any two obs uh, successive observations, right? Then it's going to be the average of these values. So the speed, the rate of calls this maximum likelihood estimate is going to be 1 over x bar. So when it comes to this question, it's going to be simply equal to find x bar for this question. And they should be somewhere here, actually. I don't know where. So I'm going to take a calculator and see what the result is. Plus 4. Plus. So this is going to be equal to, if you sum all these values, there is my pointer 70 over 5 to 14 right so the rate of calls here is going to be 1 over 14 minutes to the power minus 1 this is going to be the maximum likelihood estimate of the uh, rate parameter here in our exponential Poisson process and this is going to be the maximum likelihood there is likelihood estimate. There may be other estimates, but this is the maximum likelihood estimate, and you, you can guarantee that as n goes to infinite, not maybe n when n is equal to 5, but when n is equal to infinite, it's a very good estimate. It has very nice properties. Okay, I'm going to solve a second question. What about for a Bernoulli process? How can you find the p-value? What do I mean by Bernoulli process? Let's say that we have a coin we flip this, but we are not sure that whether this is a pure coin. And sometimes it's going to fall heads, sometimes of course it's going to tails, and we get a series of heads and tails like this. Or let's make it more chemical engineering. Again, we are producing a product, it may be faulty or it may be good working, right? And most of them are fine, but sometimes we have a faulty product. And let's say we have a series like that. From this series, we would like to estimate, note that we, we assume that this is a Bernoulli trials process. Each of them is independent, right? And then the, 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 there's constant probability of P of fault here. So we would like to estimate this quantity here. Given a certain series of these N observations, how can we find this P hat value? This is the question at hand. So now, basically, uh, if I can change the position of position. Yeah. Now I'm going to show the, the probability density function, probability mass function of binomial distribution, uh, binomial distribution in a little bit of a strange way by this formula. First, make sure that we understand that this is the uh, probability mass function is 1 minus p over 1 minus x probability of x. 
and x is going to be 0 and 1. What does that mean? For instance, when x is equal to 0, it means it's going to be 1 over 1 minus p over 1, p to the power 0. p to the power 0 is 1. Therefore, it means the probability of f0 is equal to 1 minus p. And when is probability of outcome 1 is going to be equal to put 1 here. Therefore, this is going to be 0. So 1 minus p to the power 0 is going to be 1, p to the power x. x is equal to 1, so it's going to be p. So this seemingly difficult to understand equation simply says that if uh, the probability of the x is being equal to 0 is 1 minus p, probability of x equal to 1 is simply p. That's that much simple. But we need actually such a, a seemingly complicated expression in order to compute the li likelihood function as you are going to see in a minute. And the question is, given a certain series, a series would be like 1, 1, 0. OK, so let's take uh, 1 as the faulty product. So non-faulty, 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 faulty, non-faulty, 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 faulty. A series like that. From this series, we would like to estimate the single parameter p. So what we do is exactly what we have done previously. What was the idea? Likelihood of x, right? with the population parameter p is going to be equal to we are going to be writing this expression for each outcome for each uh, experiment so it's going to be one minus p one minus x1 this one times p to the power x1 times one minus p one minus x2 whatever the result of x2 one or zero p to the power x2 that 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 one minus P uh, is going to be 1 minus xn, e to the power xn. This is going to be our likelihood function, the very strange strategy that we are going to follow. Then we make this uh, function look nicer. In common parentheses of 1 minus p, we can write 1 minus x1, 1 minus x2, 1 minus xn, all of these, we add those. So it's going to be, when you add these ones, it's going to be n, n minus is going to be xi from i1 to n and the next term p is going to be equal to x1 x2 xn x they are going to be xi i repeat again xi can only be one or zero so when you add these values for instance this corresponds to total number of so if this is our series 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 it's going to be equal to just two these are the number of faulty products so we are going to call this t and now again, this is going to be t. And n minus t is not that is going to be the number of zeros here. It's going to, are going to be the number of non-faulty products. So let's write it again in a nicer form. It's going to be n minus t. And we have got p to the power t. If you like, you can leave these summation signs as themselves, but it's easier to follow. The next thing that we do is take the logarithm of both sides. x is going to be equal to n minus t ln 1 minus p plus t ln p. Then apply the derivative. The first derivative is, is going to be equal to 0 to find the extreme point where it is p at maximum likelihood estimate. This is going to be equal to 0. Right? So we have n minus t here with minus. 1 minus p maximum likelihood plus t over p maximum likelihood. So if we multiply both sides with 1 minus p maximum likelihood and minus, all right, n times p maximum likelihood plus t times p maximum likelihood going to be equal to zero. Let's go t minus tp maximum likelihood minus np maximum likelihood plus tp maximum likelihood equal to zero. These will cancel. And when you put it here, it's going to be p maximum likelihood. The estimate is going to be equal to t over n. And this is basically going to be equal to summation of xi values from i1 to n divided by n is going to be p maximum likelihood. And note that this is still going to be equal to 
this quantity again sample mean so it simply says that if this is your series and if you would like to find the uh, best the 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 maximum likelihood estimate of the failure probability here the estimate is going to be simply equal to sample mean here which is going to be 2 over for instance 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 and this is also probably very intuitive if you would like to, to obtain a, a p value of probability of success for this series it's going to be very likely that you are heuristically going to do is to add the uh, the, the, the trials the number of trials with success divided by the all all number of trials so that's it